Violence is a source of power. Throughout the existence of humanity, we've learned three main sources of power. Economy, a power that is gained through wealth and resources. A power of trade. Politics, a power derived from influence, legitimacy and laws. The power that structures societies. And the third source of power is violence. We use force to get what we want. Usually destroy our enemies and ensure obedience of people below us. And it seemed to work quite well. If today you will decide to enter a random office building, most likely you will not see managers physically punishing their employees. But violence did not disappear, it transformed. And many modern leaders argue that it's actually necessary, that soft power will not make you great. You have to rule with a strong hand, they say. Show them who's in charge, otherwise no one will respect you. Violence as a management strategy worked for thousands of years and it still works. But the question is, does it really? And if it does, to what extent? First, did you know that the level of violence in the world is actually declining? Yeah, scientists argue that present is probably the most peaceful time in the history of humanity. Hello, Mr. Pinker. It may not look like it for us based on what we observe in the world every single day, but scientists look at the trends throughout multiple centuries and it seems that it used to be much worse. But I'm a manager and my interest is to look at it from a management point of view. What did we do? before we popularized things like motivation and empowerment. Well, in ancient civilizations, slavery was pretty common. No unions, no labor contracts, pretty much no choice but to do what your superior is telling you to do. We had medieval period with all kinds of feudal, feudal systems, also pretty nasty. Colonial era with its wild exploitations and a industrial madness of 19th century where people used to work in unbelievable conditions. And then there was a big shift in early 20th century when workers began to organize strikes and form unions all for the purpose of fighting against exploitation and against violence. And in parallel with that many countries started to create laws to protect working people, which we use and develop literally till this day. But although for huge time periods Pinker and other scientists are correct, first, it doesn't mean that violence does not exist today. And second, what you used to be much more obvious, like straight up bloodshed, transformed into less obvious things. So I will tell you three stories now, all of them, by the way, absolutely real, and I will get more and more subtle with each one. First story happened with me. When I was super young, I once had a side hostel in a very small company, just a few people. On my literally second day there, I made a mistake in a task. How did I find out? My boss started yelling at me. It was one of my first jobs. He had a formal power of authority, so I was quietly listening. My go-to approach was to focus on what he was saying, not how he was saying it, and kind of try to move on from that. I apologized for a mistake and moved on with my tasks. But here's the thing. From his perspective, the story was completely different. First, it was me who did something wrong. So in his mind, his irritation and dissatisfaction were actually justified. He had a very stressful job and in his eyes he was this powerful leader who is kind of doing the thing with the weight of responsibility on his shoulders that no one else can actually understand and relate to. And he was surrounded by mediocre people who cannot even do their simple task correctly. Or maybe they're just too relaxed, so they need a motivational push. You see, two very different takes on the same story. But let's look at it from the ethical side. Do you think what he's done was okay? Raising a voice at employee that made a mistake. Well, it actually can be debatable. For example, I saw a lot of management teams and some of them had a pretty intense ways of talking to each other. Like, especially top managers, sometimes they can actually raise their voices on each other in the heat of the moment. And many of them are actually having kind of like agreements or like mutual consent on these ways of working. And even if someone in this room is someone else's manager, I mean, they're all pretty powerful. But the problem starts when you use a power against someone who does not have it. When you use fear as a tool, it is easy to raise a voice on someone who cannot answer us. Now, set aside the ethical side. Did it actually work? Did this boss of mine get what he wanted with his approach? Well, you can say that it actually did. I took this mistake very seriously and I tried to avoid repeating this as much as possible later on. Using fear as motivator does help with 
immediate compliance. It also sends signals to everyone around, so you kind of don't need to punish everyone for the same thing, you just need to make it visible enough for the rest. But here's another thing, I also quit this job as soon as I could. So for a manager, this strategy maybe has some short-term wins, but also has long-term consequences. Because there are a lot of people who, like me, don't like when their boss is yelling at them, and they're not comfortable in this type of environment. So for long-term retention, it's not that good. By the way, side note, but did you know that there is a whole corner of the internet with all types of motivational videos for this type of leaders? Usually it's a stock footage of lions or tigers with the voice of a man talking over it, like passionately tells you that a true powerful leader should be like masculine, you know, aggressive, a lone wolf on a journey to become a real man or something. Sometimes I think that folks like this manager that I used to have could be a target audience for these videos. Second story. Construction company is not doing well. They are working on the apartment building and they are behind the schedule. And the longer it is, the higher the cost is for them and the smaller their profit will be, to the extent that there is even the chance of the worst. Directors not getting their annual bonuses. So they decide to reinforce the construction team with migrant labor. I mean, why not? Migrants are hardworking and they don't ask for such high pay. Maybe this manager didn't even give an explicit order. They just kind of turned the blind eye on these practices. In the end, construction was finished on time and everyone is happy. You can ask, but what does it have to do with violence as a management strategy? And this, ladies and gentlemen, is an example of a structural violence. It takes form of systems and policies that harm or exploit people. Let's look at it from the worker's side. You are an immigrant and you agreed on the low-paid job because you don't have a lot of options. There is literally a local person in the same team as you, doing the same thing and they are paid more for the same job. But you cannot defend yourself like they can. You don't have a legal protection. It is easy to threaten you with deportation to, in the end, push you to agree to do more for less. It is not that explicit type of violence, you know, when someone is abusing you or raises their voice or their hand. Also, this can be even legal, like depending on the country, you can pull off things like that without even violating the law. Now, will this management strategy work? And it depends, mostly it depends if you cross the legal line or the line of outrage of your customers if they will find out about you using these practices. And there are consequences of this strategy. So your practically feeding a system of inequality. But to be super honest with you, usually managers of these companies don't face this type of consequences themselves. The last story happened to a friend of mine who is a project manager. She once got assigned to lead a project of her dreams. Like, if she finishes it well, it would become a lifelong highlight of her CV. It is Monday morning and on a regular stand-up meeting, she finds out that someone delays their part in the project. She asks why and the person responds that they have too many things on their plate right now, that's why this particular part of the project will be delayed. My friend insists on breaking it down, like what are the things that compete with her project, how urgent or important are these tasks, can it be moved and who has the authority to make this decision. And as a result, a person who has some of these tasks delayed gets pretty unhappy, visibly unhappy uh, with this conversation but project management still keeps asking and does not let it go. And after this meeting, some people started calling her behind her back that aggressive bitch. But now let's think, was it really aggressive? Because we often tend to confuse being aggressive and being assertive. And unfortunately, we do this often when it comes to behaviors of women. She was firm in how she spoke. She focused on solving the problem and did not let it go before she actually figured it out. By the way, no shame at all to a person she spoke to because maybe they just had problems with setting their priorities and it led to a delay. Things happen. But being assertive, maybe even insistent, does not equal being aggressive and violent, even though her behavior technically made someone feel discomfort. The key difference is that aggression comes from a place of anger. You feel this emotion, you want to kind of translate it to other person, you want the person on the other side of the table to feel 
what you feel. Being assertive comes from care and concern for the results. She didn't feel outraged and wanted to spill it over on others around her in this meeting. She was calm, respectful, but firm because she cares about the end results. So, as you can see, aggressive management strategies technically can work and can be helpful in some situations, but the downside is it is very short term and the strategies has long term consequences. Leaders who are more long term successful play power game differently. When they work with their team, they focus more on supporting and inspiring instead of manipulating with fear. I personally believe that in most of the cases, violence as a management strategy is unnecessary and obsolete. I utterly dislike glorification of power distance. And to be honest, I'm not even a big fan of using military terms in business. But it doesn't mean that we should, I don't know, all turn into hippies or something. Sometimes I see people making it like a choice between two extremes, which is so not the case. Because my point is, let's just be decent people, okay? Be kind to people who have less power than we do. People who are managers today maybe will be in charge of huge corporations of this world like 15 years from now. And I personally hope that they will not be violent human beings. And by the way, you can make your team reliable without using all of these violent practices. I made a video about my top five ways how to finally deliver gate without stressing about it. So check it out if you like. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you there.